you can adopt a legalistic approach to anything. And if you look at minimalism as a religion where the fewer things I possess, the better I am, that's not minimalism, that's legalism. What is minimalism? Is that mm. just a fancy modern word for asceticism or for temperance? I think of the words of St. Paul here who says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset us. What's clutter for you may not be clutter for me and vice versa. And minimalism is the willingness to sit with the following question. How might my life be more with less? Every single piece of advice is capable of making your life worse and possibly even destroying it if you don't think critically and creatively about how it uniquely applies to your life. How many people have a mentor that really knows them and can work with them closely on the things they need to work on? I'm also dying to hear how someone went from being the most unlikely person to become Catholic to here you are holding your rosary. <laughs> the church is not something that is dispensable. It's not something that we can take this approach of saying, hey, uh, give me the Jesus, but not the church. TK Coleman, welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm so glad to be here. It's so cool to have you here. Yeah, this is this is uh, going to be a fun conversation. I can already feel it. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> There's a lot. So the Minimalist podcast, your podcast, it has 100 million downloads and there's a lot to minimalism today. I think that words thrown around, mm -hmm. it's amazing the success of the show, by the way, Thank and you. what you're doing. It's yeah. very cool, congratulations. So I wanna talk about that. You're a fascinating guy because you're coming into this, but you have your own story. You're, you recently entered the Catholic Church. That's right, I hear. February 20th, 2022. Crazy. Yeah. All right, so there's so much here and we're both Southern Californians. No, I'm, I'm actually from Chicago. But, but you're here now. Here. You're we here now. Here, yeah. We're claiming you. All right. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> you moved here just a couple years ago, right? That's right. That's right. And you have St. Michael's Abbey here and uh, Father Ambrose, who I'm a really big fan of. Who yeah. I know you know, so we share him in common as well. Yes. But yes, yes. Been here for two years now. Moved out here to join the Minimalists and team up with them. We do our weekly show. We also have live shows that we do every month in LA. We've got a nice little theater out there that we do the shows at. Yeah, I'm just excited. It's fun work. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. Let's start yeah. with who is TK Coleman, a little oh, bit gosh. about your background for people that aren't familiar yet. Well, uh, my father is a pastor, so I grew up in a Pentecostal church with uh, a praying mom and a praying dad. And, you know, I, I think about, is it the book of Proverbs, when you when you read the first sentence there where uh, Solomon open up, opens up the book, he says, uh, son of David, king of Israel. He tells you who his dad is before he tells you what his job is. And so I take a similar approach. I think uh, who my parents are, are the biggest thing I have to be proud of. They are the ones who introduced me to a life of prayer. Uh, they are the ones who taught me that the most important thing in life is, is the spiritual aspect of things. And uh, everything else is the outworking of that. And I'm still blessed enough to have them with me. Um, and they're just wonderful people. And, and they they raised my brothers and I with a lot of love. I come from a family where uh, you've got four boys and we said, I love you to each other every mm -hmm. night before going to bed. You know, I love hugged that. my father, kissed my father on the cheek every night before going to bed. And I didn't realize how rare of an experience that was, how beautiful and to be cherished of an experience that was. And so, yeah, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, that, so that's, that's who I am, that aspect of where I come from, um, everything else, are details that can change, you know, what my job is, where I happen to live, and that's secondary stuff. But uh, I am happily married to uh, a woman who uh, is a cradle Catholic, and she had a, a great influence on on my own spiritual journey. I, I know we may talk about this later, but one little thing that I've come to appreciate is a year before my conversion, um, uh, she followed the De Montfort way of consecration, mm -hmm. and she committed to praying the rosary for a year. Mm -hmm. And I knew that she was doing that in a rather casual, non-defensive, completely disinterested way. Do you? I support you. But it was uh, a year later after she completed that rosary commitment that um, that it descended upon me, you know, that this is who I am and this is the step that I need to take. And we can unpack that a little later. But as time passes, I, uh, you know, because people joke a lot when, when you're a non-Catholic and you're married to a Catholic they, they assume, oh, it's, it's the girl who made you become Catholic. But I literally looked my wife in the eye and told her, I'm never becoming Catholic. No disrespect, no hate, but that's just not me. And so um, if there was anyone in the world, had you gone to her and says, who is to you the most unlikely candidate to ever become Catholic? She wouldn't have said, oh, this person here who practiced this 
practices this devious thing over there. She would say, oh, my husband. And so when I sat her down to tell her uh, that this was the deal, she was absolutely floored, absolutely shocked. But um, I give her credit. She hates when I do this, but I give her the credit for my conversion because it was that prayer. Um, and I emphasize that aspect of the story because I think there are a lot of people out there who maybe worry about loved ones. And I'm not the one to tell you don't worry about your loved ones because I have a testimony of converting them. I'm the one to tell you don't worry about your loved ones because I am one of the loved ones who was lost and whose prayers brought him into Holy Mother Church. Yeah. Wow. I, I, that's so beautiful yeah. because I think a lot of people listening, maybe they're not even Catholic yet and they're worried about their loved ones for yeah. faith anyways, or they are practicing Catholic and they're worried about those loved ones. How does a guy like you, you end up on, you end up doing this minimalist podcast. Mm -hmm. You move out here to California two years ago, which most people are moving away from California. <laughs> right. And simultaneously you're having this incredible conversion process. There's so much to unpack here. So I want to start with, you shared about a little bit about your background and mm -hmm. ra being raised in sounds like an incredibly beautiful family. How did your career take you to the point where you were moving to Southern California for one of the top podcasts in the world to be a host on it? Sure. So one quick comment about moving into a place like uh, California when everyone else is moving away. I, I think it's it's quite easy to approach one's life in the abstract by, you know, looking at the statistics about where the happiest people are or what are the <laughs> cheapest places to live. And I think the the best approach to take with anything like this is to say, what is my vocation? What is my life about? because God sends different people into different places. I don't think Nineveh was Jonah's dream city, <laughs> right? I, I think uh, it's a place that he was sent. And so I think if you think about where you're going to go in life only in terms of what's going to give me maximum pleasure or what resonates with me, and you don't think about it in terms of where am I being sent? What does my mission demand of me? Where am I willing to live? Where am I willing to go because of the work to which I've been called? And so for me, mm. I don't care if California is going to hell in a handbasket. I don't care if there's a lot wrong with California. I'm not here as an endorsement of the beauty of California. I'm here as an act of obedience with the discernment I have of my purpose. And if I'm called to go somewhere else, I'm out of here because I have no loyalties to this place. I have a loyalty um, only to that. But how did it turn about? How did it turn out that I ended up with these guys? So Years ago, I did a series of conversations with my good friend, Steve Patterson, who has a philosophy podcast, Patterson in Pursuit. And the minimalist guys heard that and they thought it would be interesting if, if we had a conversation. And at that time, I was running an apprenticeship program with my uh, good friend, Isaac Morehouse, and we talked about education and we just did a full episode on that. And the, the chemistry was so good. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that I went on a podcast and I didn't feel like a guest I didn't feel like I was being interviewed. I felt like I was hanging out with brothers mm -hmm. and we were having a good time and the cameras happened to be on. Mm -hmm. And that went so well, we decided to do a few more. Uh, eventually I'm showing up on the podcast every three months and we're just having a good time. They then invited me out to do their uh, Les Coast tour with them. Mm -hmm. And you know we really got to know each other there. And at some point it just started to make sense to have a conversation about, hey, what can we do to make this more of a regular thing. We love you, you love us, we like doing this work together. And uh, we we worked out those details and it resulted in my wife and I making a surprising leap from beautiful South Carolina to Southern California. So just the mentioning of those two places lets you know this is an act of obedience because South Carolina is beautiful. All right, it's beautiful, <laughs> but I, I mean, I love California too. We're very beautiful here, but what, what was it in your discernment process? You mentioned it was an obedience. I love that perspective, by the mm -hmm. way. Like we don't live where, as Christians, we don't live where we live because of pursuit of pleasure. We should be living where we live out of obedience to our vocation and our calling. So what was it about joining the minimalist team? Mm -hmm. Again, super popular podcast. Some people listening know all about it, or maybe they're not in that space yet, but this is one of the top podcasts in the world. Mm -hmm. And especially in in the category of you know health lifestyle, this is a top podcast, 100 million downloads is crazy. So what was the obedience that you were practicing yeah. when you said yes to that invitation? Yeah, so I've known these guys for several years now, and so it was a gradual process mm -hmm. of getting to know them and so on. But I, I think it really came down to um, where can I nurture and be nurtured? You know, so I, I think of this in a, in a similar manner as to like 
being part of a church community. If you think about this only in terms of what place is going to serve me and nurture me, that's a problem. You're approaching it with a consumeristic mindset that's not going to end well. But if you only think about it in terms of where can I serve, mm-hmm. you're, you're thinking about it in a, in a sort of savior mindset, which isn't going to end well. You have to go where you can both serve, mm-hmm. where you truly are needed and you need to contribute, and where you will be served as well, a place where you can be fed and built up. And the combination of the way in which I can challenge these guys and the way in which they challenge me, uh, the combination of how I can invest in that community and how that community invests in me, every aspect of that really lined up. And uh, there were a number of signal graces along the way, too, as, as my wife and I prayed about the decision that that uh, really confirmed things. And, and that could be worth unpacking uh, in this conversation as well, the, the role of the rosary and the signal graces that they've played in providing guidance in my life. All right. I'm excited to get to that. What are the topics with a minimalist podcast that you most enjoy exploring? And also, what is mm. minimalism? Is that mm. just a fancy modern word for asceticism or for temperance? Oh, that's good. That's good. All right, let's let's address what is minimalism first. So I think of the words of, of St. Paul here who says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset us. Uh, I think every life is, is oriented or, or predisposed towards uh, some kind of teleological end. We can, we can refer to that as a vocation or as a calling, but it, it's the purpose for which you've been designed. And on our road to pursuing that or practicing that, we encounter a lot of temptations in the form of things to be possessed, things to be pursued, uh, things with which to be preoccupied. And these become little traps for us that lead to a, a life of defeat, a life of discouragement, a life of distraction, and so on. And so I see minimalism as the willingness to let go of anything that gets in the way of that teleological end. What is my life about? What is my why? Why am I here? What is the impact that I am to have? What is my road to sainthood? And clutter becomes anything that gets in the way of that, which means clutter is relative and contextual. What's clutter for you may not be clutter for me and vice versa. I may see you doing something that you're at peace with, but my conscience won't allow me to do it because we have different ends towards which our life lives are directed. Another way to think about this, um, lots of Bible examples are coming to me right now. I think of the rich young ruler. Mm. He comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to be saved? Um, and Jesus tells him, you know, follow the commandments. And he says, well, I've done this since my youth. And I always wonder how that conversation would have turned out had he just said, okay, thank you for the answer. Thank you for the answer. But he, but he, but he says, I, I've done this since my youth. And, and Jesus says, well, you lack one thing. And it's, it's interesting that he, that he speaks of it as a, as a lack, because here is a man with abundance, and Jesus is describing him as someone who's lacking something, someone who's missing something. Uh, and he says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the young ruler was grieved, and he walks away. And I like the fact that he was portrayed as one who grieved, because that indicated that he had a longing for this spiritual liberation that Jesus offered him. And at the same time, he walked away. And that illustrates for me something that's crucial to the concept of minimalism, which is our lives are not merely defined by what we long for, but by what we're willing to let go of. Mm. And the world of success, the world of uh, self-help encourages us all the time to ask questions like, how can I be more? How can I be more for my family? How can I be more for my career? How can I do more? How can I save more? How can I accomplish more? And minimalism is the willingness to sit with the following question. How might my life be more with less? Not merely in the mathematical sense, but also in the sense of what role does simplicity and sacrifice play in my pursuit of a meaningful life? And I think the willingness to be present to that question, not as a one-time thing, but as a kind of spiritual practice, That's what minimalism is to me. Do you want to enjoy the most delicious cup of coffee that you've ever had in your life? 
then you've got to check out sevenweekscoffee.com. I love a Seven Weeks Coffee because this is a company that sources their beans ethically from the top one to 2% of all coffee beans in the world. They also have direct relationships through fair trade with the coffee farmers so you can get the most high quality roasts. Sevenweekscoffee.com is also low acid, gourmet, small batch roasted coffee that is always fresh and is delivered right to your door. My favorite thing though about sevenweekscoffee.com isn't just that it's the most delicious cup of coffee that you're gonna drink, but that Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of all of their revenue, not just their profits, directly to pregnancy resource centers to help moms and babies in need. In fact, sevenweekscoffee.com has given over half of a million dollars because of your purchases directly to help moms and babies in need through pregnancy resource centers. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today. You can use the code Lila at checkout and you can get up to 25% off your first order by joining the Heartbeat Club. The Heartbeat Club is your special coffee subscription club that you get fresh coffee delivered right to your door. And by joining the club, you are donating to your pregnancy resource center of choice to help moms and babies in need. I recommend you check out the Ethiopian medium roast. That is my favorite. I've had friends tell me that the Hope Roast is their favorite. There's all kinds that you can pick from dark, medium, light. They've even got the decaf roast. Use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your order. Drink the most delicious cup of coffee you've ever had and help save lives while you're doing it at sevenweekscoffee.com. How do you deal with, though, the, the spiritual realm of abundance mm -hmm. and God wants to give us spiritual abundance? Of course, in the material world, that might look like poverty for some. That's why, sure. uh, you know, religious orders take a vow of poverty sure, in pursuit yeah. of spiritual abundance, yeah. you know, to seek God in his fullness and not be distracted by the things of the world and to be fully focused on service. But I think for people maybe living the vocation of marriage like us or, you know, people who are not maybe living in the religious a religious life, but they're people of the, of the faith, right? I mean, wealth is not bad. We're called to have dominion over the world. That's a command in Genesis. God gave and trusted the world to Adam and Eve and their descendants to be fruitful and multiply and to be masters of creation. How does minimalism play mm. into also the mandate for us to create more wealth, goodness, abundance, not just for the, our own sake, but for other people to be creative mm. and co-create with God in creating. And by wealth, I don't just mean money. I mean, goodness, good in general. Yeah. And that can obviously be uh, money. It's currency for that. That's so good. It can yeah. be a currency for that. Yeah. I, I think the most tragic form of poverty are those forms which define wealth exclusively in terms of material goods. Um, from an economic standpoint, money is a symbolic representation of our creative power. So how do you go from having no money to having money? Well, the way you make that leap is through value creation, right? And so the one could say that one of the uh, highest expressions of our humanity is to take that which has been given to us in terms of the Earth's resources and exercise the kind of stewardship over these things that transforms them, modifies them, rearranges them in such a way that we make it more valuable to someone else. That's what's happening economically. When someone pays us for something, they're saying what you were able to do with the resources of your life is solving a problem for me, creating value for me in a way that makes me willing to engage in exchange. And so when we think about wealth, not in terms of what I have, but what I do with what I have, then we have a more of a spiritual understanding of what wealth is. Um, in fact, you could say, if I were to give you a Tesla right now, that wouldn't make you wealthy. What would make you wealthy is your use of that Tesla to serve other people, to solve problems, and to create value for yourself and others. That's what wealth is. It's defined by what we do. And so I like to think of minimalism as, as not, not scarcity, but abundance healthfully expressed. Because the problem with anything in life, minimalism is no exception, is that you can adopt a legalistic approach to anything. And if you look at minimalism as a religion where the fewer things I possess, the better I am, that's not minimalism, that's legalism. Uh, because it's, you know, that's just a means to an end. You're, you're not, you know, if, uh, I'm a good person because I only have five things. And if I can get it down to four, I'm an even better person. And if I can get that down to three, I'm an even better person. No, you can be a complete jerk with only three things. You can be very cruel with only three things. You can be very inconsiderate and unloving and selfish with only three things. And you could be very generous with thousands of things, right? And so I, I think about that proverb that says, 
Wisdom is a defense just as money is a defense. But the advantage of wisdom is that it gives life to those who preserve it, which is why we're told elsewhere in Proverbs mm -hmm. that wisdom is the principal thing and to obtain that and with all of our getting to get understanding. And so the kind of wealth that we should prioritize is, is the wisdom of discerning God's will for our lives. It's, it's the wisdom of, of, um, of charity and chastity, that purity of heart. And that sometimes leads to um, what the world might recognize as status or abundance, but it sometimes might lead to what the world recognizes as a loser's life. But <laughs> you can know that you are rich, not because of how the world defines you or how the world sees you or because of how many things you have, but rather what you're doing with the life that has been given to you. So it sounds like you're saying minimalism is not about per se having less or doing less, but it's about anything that is maybe not oriented, stripping away, I mean, in your in your categorization or your definition, stripping away anything that is not oriented towards true wealth, <laughs> which yeah. we can define as, you know, relationships, love, service, the things that are more than material. Material goods are meant to serve the true wealth, which has to do with maybe you could say the flourishing of the human person if we wanted to put a point on it. Yeah, that's exactly is right. That, okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you could look at it as, all right, here's this really unique framing that I'm giving to it, but you could also look at it as the logical response to a very reasonable question that one can ask about minimalism. And that is, what's the point? Okay. If you're going to live with less, if you're going to own fewer things, if you're going to emphasize the role of decluttering and the role of simplifying, what's the point? And the only reasonable answer to that is it makes more room for the things, tangible or intangible, that matter most to me. So minimalism doesn't begin with what can I get rid of? Minimalism begins with what's my life about? In fact, let's say that you and I are, are talking and we notice that on this table there's like a necklace. And I say, Lila, what should I do with this necklace? You don't know the answer to that question until you get the answer to a more fundamental question. And that is, whose necklace is it? And then if, if someone says, uh, oh, that's Janet's necklace, we'll return the necklace to Janet. It belongs to her. Or we say, no, nobody can figure out who owns it. Well, let's take it to lost and found. <laughs> knowing what to do with the thing only comes from knowing who that belongs to and knowing why it's there. Or not, we don't have to know why it's there, but we have to know who it belongs to. And in a similar way, knowing what to do with our stuff. It's like, well, whose is this? Why is it even there? Why was it bought in the first place? And so on. And once we start to understand those things, we'll know what to do with it rather easily. And this is why, you know, going back to your earlier question of what do I like to talk about the most with minimalism, I like to shift the conversation from the stuff to the story. Mm -hmm. Because even when minimalism looks like it's about the stuff, it's never just about the stuff. It's always about the stories behind it. I'll give you an example. Let's say... Uh, and this is a very common problem when people are trying to get rid of things. Let's say you have a, a T-shirt that was given to you as a gift from a very good friend. And you're, you're going through your house and you're decluttering. And you look at this T-shirt and you kind of want to throw it away. But it feels like throwing away that friend or throwing away the love that they have for you. And so you hang on to it. One day your friend comes over and they see that T-shirt and they say, Hey, Lila, I see that you still have that T-shirt of mine. Uh, and you go, yeah, yep, I'm still hanging on to it. And they say, boy, that really means a lot to me. You know what? This reminds me, I never told you this, but when I bought that t-shirt for you, I was on vacation and I went to this auction and, and someone said, here is the t-shirt that Ted Bundy wore. And I bought that for you and I got it. How do you feel about the t-shirt now? Get this thing out of here, right? This is disgusting. What was indispensable a moment ago has now become reprehensible. What you couldn't let go of a moment ago is now something that you couldn't get rid of fast enough. And you might be pretty upset with this friend for not telling you this, but what changed? The t-shirt the is still made out of cotton. It's still got the same logo. You still look the same when you put it on. What changed? The story that you're telling yourself about that t-shirt and what it means for you to wear it. Now, that may be a dramatic example, but whenever people are attached to things, whenever they are perplexed by things, Whenever they are burdened by things, it's always because there is a story behind mm -hmm. it. It's never about the thing. It's about what will it mean for me? 
to let this go? What will it mean for me to take this in? What will it mean for me to receive it or to give it? This is what the rich young ruler struggle was. It wasn't just about the things. It's what does this mean for my identity? What does this mean for my future, for my life? What happens to me? Who am I when I'm no longer the rich young ruler? And I think that's a story for all of us. We all have to confront that question. What are the forms of freedom that are at risk for us and our unwillingness to let things go? So I think about this as kind of a countercultural movement. I think that's why the Minimalist Podcast has been so successful is because we are very materialistic society in many ways. I mean, I think the credit card debt is over a trillion dollars is my yeah. understanding. Uh, there's people that are constantly trying to buy, you know, fast fashion is in, fast food is obviously yeah. everywhere. Obesity is another issue we're facing and all the health conditions mm. with that. But I think there's just a lot of emphasis on having things and having the best things. And in the social media world, there's a temptation to want to have more experiences, which are costly, often vacations, events, whatever, have more products. It's all about buying stuff. But those things are not inherently bad, right? It's just a matter of how they're used and what end to your point they're used for. Are there sort of, is there advice, standard advice that you give for how to think about or make purchase decisions? Like for example, should people buy Teslas or should they just get a used Toyota? Mm. Like yeah. what's the minimalist, you, you know, your answer to that? I have to give that specific thing. Um, well, that, that would be like me saying- <laughs> He's like uh, an anti-product <laughs> ad right here. Yeah. Well, that would be like me saying, um, should you fly? Should you drive or should you walk? What's your answer to that? I mean, I, what is the minimalist way? The, the question we should ask in response to that is, where am I going? If you're going next door, it's not just inefficient to fly. That's a very bad decision. You're wasting money. You're wasting fuel. You're burning time. You're going out of your way. And you might not even get there because you're going to have to land the plan, some, plane somewhere further away, right? So that's a bad answer. Not just, oh, what works for you? What, what works for me? Um, but if you're going to Chicago, uh, I might recommend plane first and, and driving as a kind of backup if, if you're willing to, uh, to embrace the difficulties of that road trip. And so before we can answer a question like that, we have to come down to like, well, where are you going? Who's asking it Who's and asking? what do they need it for? So yeah. what about your average like suburban family that commutes 30 minutes? I mean, I guess to actually live by the minimalist standard and mm -hmm. to make concrete decisions. Like the, you mentioned the young rich man, he went away sad, but then he didn't change his life, That's right. right? To actually change our life practically, what does it look like? People are like, okay, it sounds good. You know, you don't need everything and all these constant products. You shouldn't be going into debt for things you don't need anyways, but how do we define in the modern world what we need, I guess is the question. Yeah. Because there's so many options. Covenant Eyes helps men and women achieve victory over porn addiction by blocking explicit websites and helping you connect with your accountability partner. This is such a beautiful approach to ensuring that people can have victory over porn addiction. Covenant Eyes has a special program called Arise, which is a 21-day video series specifically designed to help Christian women overcome sexual addiction. Arise helps you identify the wounds at the root of sexual addiction. This is a safe and confidential community for support. You can get 30 days of Covenant Eyes for free by going to the link in the description and using the code Lila at checkout. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons why I, I really love, um, I do a lot of coaching. And one of the things I love about this is that I'm able to, to go deep with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis in a way that you can't quite do on a podcast. I think one of the problems with the politicization of everything, particularly in our country, is that we think about people in terms of categories and demographics, right? We talk about the poor as an abstraction, right? And, mm -hmm. and people who don't even know any individuals that are actually poor uh, are philosophizing about this abstract entity called the poor. We talk about people of this race. We talk about people of that political party. And we look for answers and, and solutions and recommendations for entire demographics. And one of the most important aspects of connecting with human beings and having meaningful conversations with human beings is to remember that you're never sitting across from a demographic. You're always sitting across from an individual. And when two individuals, even if they look alike, even if they vote the same way, ask you a question like, how do I deal with fear? Yeah, I know what the vocabulary word fear means. 
I, I, I can repeat back to you what the dictionary says. And so at a certain level, I understand what you're asking me, but there's another level where I don't understand what you're asking me. And it's not because I'm not trying, it's because curiosity is necessary to fill the gap. Respect for your human dignity is necessary to fill the gap. Having a sense of wonder about the multi-dimensional nature of humanity is what's necessary to fill the gap. And that's where you have to ask, well, what are you afraid of? I can't tell you how to deal with fear in some abstract universal way. That question sounds very meaningful, but you're not asking me that in the abstract. You have some feelings behind that question. You have a story behind that question. What are you afraid of? And for one person, it might be, well, I'm actually not afraid of meeting new people at all. I'm not afraid of working hard. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm just afraid of standing up in front of a crowd and giving a talk. Oh, okay. That's a very different kind of fear than the person who says, oh, I'm not afraid of any of that. I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid of losing this loved one. I'm afraid of being a bad father. And all of those have different answers, right? Um, because the individual behind them, and I think we are moving in the direction of becoming the kind of society where we're so eager to answer questions with talking points that we are not taking the time to hear the cries of the heart that are behind every question. Now, with that being said, let me give something. Um, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why we're so preoccupied with like uh, buying things is um, because, you, you know, when, when, I, when, I, when I think about what St. Paul says about the, the weight and the sins uh, that doth so easily beset us, in the, in the next verse he says, so, so let us run with patience, the race. And, and I think that's interesting language because it seems to imply that the opposite of, of being distracted by all this stuff and held back by all this stuff is running with patience, mm. which is different from what I would expect. I I would expect him to say something like, hey, lay aside the weight so you can run really fast. But he's saying lay aside the weight so you can run with patience. And many of the traps that we fall into are the result of us trying to accelerate or shortcut our way through processes that are meant to be slow. You know, Alan Watts said regarding music that the purpose of a song if it were to finish it, the best musicians would be the ones who played the fastest. But there are some things in life that are not valuable because of our ability to finish them quickly. Some things are valuable because of our ability to be present, because of our ability to be slow, because of our ability to learn whatever that process is trying to teach us. And I think one of the things that the message of, of simplicity has for this generation is the positive role that suffering and sacrifice plays in our pursuit of a meaningful life. What's happening now is that we are being fed messages by some of the most brilliant minds of our time who have a lot to gain by these kinds of indoctrination. We are being fed messages that you are what you have. You are what you have. And not only that, but you are what she has. You are what he has. You are what she looks like and what he looks like. And they present you with images of things, most of which aren't even real, telling you that unless you get that, unless you get that, you don't get to be a player in the game. And one of the reasons why I take issue with this idea that that uh, simplicity is only for rich people is because you don't have to possess something in order to be preoccupied with it. You don't have to possess it in order to pursue it. And most of the people that are preoccupied with things are people that don't possess it, but they're defining their lives by the pursuit of it because of stories that they're being fed by people who are socially engineering the world to get us to all ask the same set of questions, to get us all to debate the same set of issues, to all think in the same direction. And so a lot of our young people today are up against a very powerful force where it feels psychologically impossible to desire what is right. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a term called hyperpleasure that uh, refers to the, the challenge that this generation is having to be satisfied with simple things that are more valuable and entertaining than the things they're accustomed to. So for example, one could make the case that um, sunlight is more entertaining than scrolling on your phone. But scrolling on your phone is a form of hyper pleasure. It's engineered in a way to give you these artificial dopamine hits that can't be matched by the sun, by the sun, right? And so we're so addicted to artificial pleasure that whenever we get a dosage of real pleasure, like sunlight and, and fresh water, 
and clean air, a hike, going out into the mountains, mastering a skill, we say this is boring, not because it's intrinsically boring, but we, but, but because we have to rewire ourselves to enjoy simplicity again. It's like drugs. We're drug addicted. We're drug addicted. And we suffer from a, a great, great disordering of our natural God-given appetites. And, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're at a place now where things like the pleasure of mastering a new language or mastering an instrument, the pleasure of talking to a human being face-to-face and making friends, the pleasure of reading something that's not just a blog, but a, a long book where you have to stick with a train of thought for a really long time, the pleasure of going for a walk or going for a hike. These are hard pleasures, not hyper pleasures, but hard pleasures are the pleasures that last long. They feel the most rewarding. And what we need to do to counter the, the world's message of hyper pleasure is to shift the focus from the stuff to the creative power that we have as human beings to make something of this world that it wasn't when we got here. And I think that's the direction in which the solution lies. Yeah. That's so good. It's so, I mean, what you're talking about too is love. Like yeah. love, like, yeah. like love is wanting the good for the other person and, and just kind of being in the present moment with the person to accept them as they are, receive them and give your own self in that moment to in, coexist together, you know, that word. Yeah. And we are so distracted by the stuff, as you say. Uh, there's so much that you just said that I was, I was thinking about. That. I was like, oh, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. When you were saying earlier, when I asked about the practical, like Tesla or Toyota. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. I didn't no, that practical. I mean, it's all yeah. such good stuff. And I think your point there, and I want to go. You said multiple things. I want to come back to your point there was really powerful too, TK, because you were talking about, you know, you can't just give a prescription on a podcast that's going to. There's no one size fits all. Yes, don't buy this, buy that. Yes, live this way, not that way. You know, everybody has different needs. Everybody has different challenges, different callings, like you were saying earlier. And I do think there's a temptation in the podcasting media world at general, the self-help world for prescription, right? Like this is what you guys should do. I mean, I don't know if you you see this, mm -hmm. but I see this like, especially like mommy bob culture, like Instagram, this is how you should deal with your toddler. This is what you should do. This is what you should do here. And there's not, a shared habit culturally of mentorship. You know, there's not like relationship mentorship habits that we have that we ha are intergenerational where it's like this generation is personally getting to know you, understand you, you get to know them and they help train you in what they've learned, the wiser lady, wiser man training the younger one. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And we all go to the podcast for the advice. I mean, people listening, don't stop listening, please. But, <laughs> you know, um, you know, they go to the Minimalist podcast, they're listening to their shows, yeah. maybe they're reading their books. That's good. There's good stuff there. Yeah. But how many people have a mentor that really knows them and understands them and can work with them closely on the things they need to work on? like to really be seen with all of your issues and all of your challenges and be worked on with. I mean, I think that's an increasingly rare experience for people today. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and prescriptions are are interesting because they tend to make people feel very satisfied or very angry with you. <laughs> um, when you're on the internet and you give a prescription, mm. you're gonna have a whole lot of people excited to tell you how wrong you are. And you're gonna have some people that say, great, I'm happy, I'm gonna go try mm. this. And that's very good for engagement. Both of those things are very good mm -hmm. for engagement, right? So if you're if you're making people mad, that's also good for you know social media success. But this makes me think, and so it's, it's a strong temptation for content creators uh, to approach things that way. But you know, this makes me think of what I call the mother of advice. There's advice, but the mother of all advice is that um, every single piece of advice is capable of making your life worse and possibly even destroying it if you don't think critically and creatively about how it uniquely applies to your life. So you can give me dietary advice, you can give me relationship advice, and I can still use that information to make my life worse because it's my job to think critically and creatively about how does this map on to my life. And so advice is not a place to hide. We have to do the hard work of patient discernment, the hard work of evaluating things, of contemplating things, the hard work of building relationships where we can be challenged and where people can help us to see things from a different angle. So I agree with you there all the way. Well, and it goes back to your other point you were making, which was brilliant, this idea. I, I haven't heard it couched that way, but hyper pleasure, pleasure versus, mm -hmm. versus hard pleasure. Yeah. You know, the, the natural experience that people have of like enjoying sunlight or a walk or, you know, 
playing with a baby, right? Yeah. But then we're all, you know, literally we've been hijacked our brains with, you know, social media as an example. And certainly, you know, sh like a shopping addiction, consumerism or a food addiction, you know, obsessed with food and eating food, whatever it is, all of this stuff, clutter, <laughs> yeah. uh, cluttering up our, our mind and our appetites. So we struggle to actually connect in real life. And I think that's connected back to what you're saying about the advice stuff. If you're like constantly hyped up, right? You're neurotic effectively, like you're always going yeah. and it's hard to slow down and appreciate that laughing baby or being present in the moment, right? How are you going to take the time to apply that advice you might be getting from the self-help world or podcasts or whatever to your own personal circumstances? You don't have time to think carefully about your own life certainly not to be praying in silence, you're just going. Yeah. I mean, do you, do, yeah. you, do you think that's a big issue plaguing, especially young people today where they're making all these decisions, but are they really taking time to just think and pray, certainly to get wise counsel? I mean, is that even a thing that young people make space for anymore? Well, we can, we can add a question to that as well. And that is, are we as parents, godparents, uncles, aunts, mentors, teachers, um, facilitating for them a context within which they become incentivized to do those things? And I'm not asking about the emotional experience because it's very easy to be frustrated with people, but people don't respond to our frustrations with them. They respond to the boundaries and constraints that we impose. And I think there's a big conversation to be had about those of us who are in positions of influence in the lives of these children who are making it so incredibly easy for them to amuse themselves to death. Mm. And so I, I think that's the, that's the conversation, right? Because um, God's grace can make anything possible. But one of the ways that God works in the lives of young people is through the family. And if we are not modeling for them what it looks like to slow down and to pray and to put first things first, I don't know where they're gonna get it from, you know, but we're certainly not setting them up for, for success. That's such a good point. Yeah. So when you were, you, you mentioned you were coming down to Southern California and you were praying about joining the min minimalist team and you were talking about signal graces. Mm. What, what are signal graces and can you share more about that? Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one, and everylife.com is a pro-life company. In fact, when you join the Changing Lives Club at everylife.com, you will get 10% off your order, and you will also be able to donate one month's free supply to a mom or a baby in need so that they can get the diapers that they need. Did you know that some of the biggest diaper companies today, like Huggies and Pampers, are owned by conglomerates that are pro-abortion? That's why Every Life is so important. Not only is the product better, I know from personal experience, than the Huggies and Pampers products, but the Every Life diaper is also part of a mission to save lives. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join. Join the Changing Lives Club. Use the code LILA at checkout. Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. What, what are signal graces, and can you share more about that? Yeah, so um, Blessed Alan De La Roche has the uh, 15 Promises of the Rosary, and you can just Google the Promises of the Rosary. And um, the first promise, interesting enough, from Our Lady is um, you will receive signal graces. And this is a promise that's given to those who pray the rosary daily. And um, so th this is something that I committed to very early on. I was just, I'm, I'm very thankful for the grace to just be drawn to this. Um, and um, the, rosary is, the rosary is a true lifeline. Mm -hmm. But the way I've heard signal graces described is they're kind of like supernatural synchronicities. Uh, synchronicity is a meaningful coincidence. Uh, we could say that a signal grace is a kind of meaningful coincidence that is set on your path 
to either confirm the direction in which you're moving or to confirm something that God has put on your heart. And uh, Our Lady promises those uh, to people who pray the rosary. And I've, I've had a, a few different signal graces um, as a result of this. I'll, I'll give you one. So there was a, there was a trip I was on in New Jersey to, to speak at a, a business conference. And I'm on this trip and I'm staying in a hotel that's sort of like downtown. It's, it's maybe like, a am told, maybe like a 20 minute walk from like New York City, but I'm, I'm kind of on the other side of the bridge. And so it's a, it's a cute downtown, coffee shops, restaurants, big old churches, beautiful place. And every day I walk around that area to go to a cafe or something like that. And on my last night, I finish giving my talk. I go out to eat with the people that brought me there. And I um, go to my hotel. I get ready for bed. And as I lay down, I realize that I hadn't prayed the Luminous Mysteries. I still had that left and I just forgot. And I'm like, oh man. Ah, and I know that there's no way in my PJs I'm going to sit in that hotel room and pray this. So I get back up and I get dressed and I go, I'm downtown. I'm going to go for a walk. It's a beautiful place. It's night, but I'm going to go for this walk. And there are still people out partying and hanging out and stuff like that. And so I take my rosary and I, I, go, I start walking. And I'm mostly just kind of going around the perimeter of my hotel, going around the spaces that I know. But it is pretty loud because there are a lot of people out partying. And so there's one point as I'm praying, I, I kind of see this more residential looking street. And it's quiet on that street. And I think, I'm going to go down this street because I'll get away from the noise a little bit and, and uh, continue walking and praying. And as I got ready to walk, I just felt something go no. And I don't know about you, but when you have moments like this, your first thought is, number one, don't ever tell anyone about this because I'm probably crazy or it's just me, right? And so I just kind of, you know, brush the thought off and I just feel it really strongly, like no. And I think to myself, okay, this is probably still just me, but I'm not going to go down this street anyway. You know, just who knows? in case. Yeah, just in case. Mm -hmm. And so I, I continue to walk my normal path, finish my rosary. I go back to my hotel, go to bed. Next morning I get up, Uber driver is taking me to the airport. And uh, she says, uh, so how you like it here? And I said, oh, I love it. I was like, especially this area. Like, I love this area. And she goes, <laughs> And she keeps driving. And I say, oh, please wait a minute. You can't just laugh like that and not tell me what the laugh is all about. And she goes, what did you like about this area? And I said, well, it's got a lot of cafes. It's got um, you know, a lot of restaurants. It's just, it's a real beautiful area. She goes, well, okay. I see what you're saying, if that's what you like. She goes, you know, the thing is though, at that hotel that you're staying, she goes, you just gotta be careful because there are certain streets you go down they look innocent, like nothing's going on, but it's not going to end well for you. And why did she have to tell me that? Why did the conversation go in that direction? And I just knew in my heart that it was a good thing for me not to go down that street. Uh, another time, my, my wife and I um, were driving and I'm telling her about um, this book that a friend had told me about, and it's called The Fire Within by Thomas Dubay. St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa Avila. And I'm just talking about this book and just being all excited about it. I haven't read it, but I have a friend who's telling me about it and I'm, and I'm telling my wife about it. And um, we ended up stopping at this monastery because um, she knew about this monastery in Indiana that she wanted to see and um, she really wanted mm -hmm. to stop at it. So we stopped at this monastery and I'm looking for the bookstore at the gift shop. That's what I always want to see. And they have one, but unfortunately, there's not a single book in there. They don't have any books. They've got all the other things, the rosaries and the cards and the icons and so on. And so I just look around at stuff with my wife and we go up to the register for her to pay for her things. And um, the lady sitting there um, you know, at the register is reading a book. And I go, oh, what book are you reading? And uh, she uh, holds it up and it's The Fire Within by Thomas Dubé. And I go, wow, I was just talking with my wife about that. And you know what she says? Because at this point, maybe you're thinking, oh, okay, just a coincidence. Yeah, that there wasn't a single book in that store. And the only book in that store wasn't for sale. And it was the book that this lady was reading, which is the very book I was excited about. But she says, here. And she gives me the book, right? And so I could go on. I have a lot of these kinds of experiences, but 
they're they're not just coincidences, but they're coincidences that are that are confirming something like, hey, you're 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 moving in the right direction. Yeah, that's coming from something higher than you. Yeah, I want you to look into that. You know, so that's uh that's one of the many promises of the rosary. I would encourage anybody to um to uh to look those up. But I would I would encourage anybody to uh how can I say this? To uh, give the rosary a chance, even just saying a decade of it, um, Our Lady is 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 beautiful and brilliant, and and I don't think she is just um, I don't think she's a supplement. I I, I think she's she's our health, um, and um, I think um, arguably the most underestimated truth in the world is the relevance of Mary to our our sanctification. That's a big statement yeah. and a beautiful one. And I, I want you to unpack that. I'm also dying to hear how someone went from being the most non unlikely person to become Catholic, according to your <laughs> lovely wife, to here you are holding your rosary, yeah. <laughs> going on about how important Mary is. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people who are not Catholic, especially our dear Protestant brothers and sisters, many of who listen to this show, sure. they think there's an overemphasis on Mary among Catholics. I think there's an underemphasis on Mary. Wow. A gross underemphasis on Mary. Where are all the Catholics that are praying a full rosary every day? Very few. Yeah. A gross Why does the full rosary matter? Because she says it does. She talks about it all the time. And and she's given promises to those who pray it. It's a it's a spiritual weapon, a spiritual tool that's been given to us. And it's a it's a scriptural prayer. Um that has as its center the mysteries of Christ. And uh, the saints have written about this profusely, you know, from uh, St. Louis de Montfort. Um, and, you know, I, I recommend people read his book, um, who's interested in this, The Secret of the Rosary, mm -hmm. and maybe one that's a little more accessible that, that's packed with testimonies throughout history as Father Don Calloway's mm -hmm. champion of the rosary. I would say give it a chance in terms of just reading about it a little bit. Um, but I, I'm... I'm I'm not here to say that it's a necessary prayer in the sense that if you don't pray it, you're a bad Catholic or that you're under the pain of mortal sin for not praying the rosary. Um, but when you consider what the saints have written about it, you consider the promises that Our Lady has extended to those who pray it. Um, you, you look at Fatima and she encourages us again and again to pray the rosary. Um, this is for our own purification. This is, this is to render our hearts more docile to the graces that she wants to give us. And so... Um, I, I missed the question though. You're, you're asking me. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about the conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have yeah. a, But but before we go to that, just on Mary, you know, a lot of evangelicals and non Catholics sure. think oh, yeah, that right. yeah. that they that we overestimate Mary that she becomes some kind of idol mm. to replace Jesus, and that there's more of a devotion to Mary than to Jesus. Mm. Of course, I think of some of the saints saying, "You can't love Mary too much if it's really Mary, because she's pointing you to Jesus. It only increases your love for Jesus." But there is this concern and fear among a lot of good people of faith, I would yeah. even say, that you just, you're just you overemphasizing the wrong thing. Go yeah. directly to the source. Go directly to Jesus. Yeah. So uh, a few things here. Um, one, you can't go the extra mile unless you first go the essential mile. And so before you tell me that you, I, or someone else is doing something too much, you first have to define for me how much is essential. How much is enough? And I don't really hear any conversations amongst those who make this objection for how much they think is enough. Um, and when I do hear, it sounds like it's nothing, right? What do you it, mean by that? Well, for me, I don't fear honoring Mary too much. I fear honoring her too little. Um, and I think the fear of honoring her too much is presumptuous in both directions. Uh, I'm underestimating just how much honor she is due. And I'm overestimating the value of what I give. I mean, imagine if I owe a man a million dollars and I get ready to write him a check for one and I'm worried that I'm giving him too much. The response to that is, brother, you ain't giving nothing. You know what I mean? It's like you're underestimating how much she is due, but I'm also overestimating how much I give. And so um, that's my fear that I do not honor her too much. But Let's back up a little bit because th there's something more fundamental here. Um, why don't we go to God directly and, and, and through the source? I think the problem here is that 
we tend to treat Mary um, in a way that's similar to how many people treat the concept of church, right? Um, many people look at the idea of church as, hey, this is a, a man-made association of people who get together of their own accord uh, in order to celebrate common beliefs. And that's one way to look at it. And if that's the way you look at it, I totally get why church is optional. And I totally get why you would never put up with other Christians that are annoying. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> and it's the logical outworking of that mm -hmm. ecclesiology. As Catholics, we don't see the church in that way. We see the church as Jesus's idea, right? He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. This is something that he created. And so for us, the church is not um, something that is dispensable. It's not something that we can take this approach of saying, hey, uh, mm -hmm. give me the Jesus, but not the church. You know, an, an example that I, example I give of this is, um, suppose uh, I go apply for a job and someone uh, looks at my resume, they take me through the interviewing process and they say, TK Coleman, we love you, man. We think you'd fit in really great. You understand our mission. You're clearly a hard worker and have all the relevant experiences. But um, hey, man, there's just one concern I have. Um, I was, I was looking at your photos and I, I noticed that your, 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 your body is black and, um, I'm just not, I'm just not so sure if that's going to work at my company. You know, um, I like you as a person, like I, I love your personality and your spiritual essence, but when I look at you and I'm your skin color, man, I'm just a little put off and disgusted. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, man, but I love you. I love you. Now, this isn't a political conversation about this person's right to uh, make that choice, but do you think it's possible to separate me in that way? Do you think it's possible to really look me in the eye and say, I love you. It's just your, your body disgusts me. Your skin color disgusts me. I'll use, I'll use a less loaded example. That one probably brings no, up too much I mean, attention that's, that's for people. Power, so, but you're connecting that to... No, I, I love you, Jesus, but I, 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 don't, I don't like your body. I don't like the fact that you are a man, not just God. By body, you mean like he was born of he a woman. He identifies us as a church with his body, right? Mm. So I think Christians are annoying. I don't really like them. They disappoint me all the time. They let me down all the time. So I love you, Jesus. I love like all the spirituality. Mm. I like your words and scripture because I can separate all of that from having to deal with annoying Christians, right? I can separate that from the inconvenience of going to mass. I can separate that from having to put up with priests who I don't like or put up with religious hierarchy who might make me feel embarrassed or I can mm. uh, engage all that without putting up with other Catholics who might make me feel bad. No, just give me like the scriptures and, and, and give me the abstract faith divorced from the body with which you identify. You can't do that, right? Mm. Take a different example. Let's say, let's say someone says to me, hey, TK, um, you're an awesome guy, man. I love you. I just hate your wife. I just hate her, man. But I love you. Can we still be friends? Oh, man, mm. that's tough, right? It's... Um, She's not just a person that you hate, but she is the woman that I am one with. Mm -hmm. I've bound myself to her by covenant, and she's bound herself to me that there is a certain sense in which the hate you direct towards her is also directed at me, right? And so we're his bride, right? So that's one example. So the, the question is, what has Jesus identified with? What has he given us? Is it his idea if it's man, or is it man's idea? And so when it comes to our blessed mother, I would say, look, Mary is the mother of the church, and it's not my idea, right? If, it's, if it is my idea, then it's wrong. It doesn't matter how valuable I think it is. That's the real question. The real question isn't like, would I do it this way? Because there are a lot of things I wouldn't do it this way. But the real question is, has God decided to do it this way? And God works through secondary causes. God doesn't always meet our needs directly, but he uses us to do these things and so you, you have, for instance, in, in the scriptures where um, uh, James says, confess your sins to one another and pray to one another or pray for one another that you might be healed. Now, if someone comes to you and says, hey, man, can you pray for me? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I don't want to mediate for you. Uh, you. You take that straight to Jesus. Well, now you're actually violating his will, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's a level of, of pride and arrogance that says, I know better than you. And, and the church is a kind of family. 
And when, when you have a family, sometimes the parent will have another child do something that they're capable of doing, not because it's pragmatically necessary, but because there's something you're trying to achieve when you're building a family. When you, when you tell the big sister to help the little sister tie the shoe, it's not always because you don't have time. It's not always because you can't do it, but because there's something special that can only happen when big sister helps little sister, help your sister tie the shoe, help your sister pick up her stuff. You know that you can do it. You can do it for them, but it's better that you do it for her through the other one, right? And so there are, there are moments in life where God uses us to minister to other people. He uses us to bless one another. And, you know, if, if I own the company and I'm the CEO and I say, hey, everybody, this is the manager I've appointed. Take all of your problems to him. And then you say, well, I'm not going to say anything to that manager. I'm going to take all my problems to TK. You're not <laughs> just disrespecting my manager, mm -hmm. but you're also disrespecting me because I'm the one who said, this is my manager, right? Um, and so it sounds flattering on the surface, but it's it's disrespectful to me if I give you this person as a manager and ask you to work with them. So I know I'm in heated territory here. It's I, great. I, 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 I <laughs> great know there point. are people that say, that have listened to me up mm -hmm. until this point and says, man, I might have been able to ride with you, dude, until you start talking about this Mary stuff. But mm -hmm. blessed are those who have the honor of ever being misunderstood or harassed because mm -hmm. of Our Lady, because of association with Our Lady. But I, I will say this, like for me, the critical question is, is this the mother that Jesus has given us? As Catholics, we believe that um, with, with the ancient church, that this is the mother of the church. She's our model. She's the first among believers. And it is part of her job given to her to nurture us in the faith and to intercede for us. Mm -hmm. And so she becomes for us a kind of, not just a supplement, but, you know, St. Louis de Montfort describes her as, as the living oratory within which all of our acts of devotion are performed. So everything that we do is contextualized by that motherly advocacy. Father Frank Duff, the founder of the Legions of Mary, says that Mary adds nothing to God, but she adds immeasurable graces to all of our efforts to please God. She adds nothing to him. But everything that we do for God, Mary adds graces to it through her intercession and through her advocacy. And so um, another reason why I don't fear honoring her too much is because honoring Mary for those who actually do it, not for those who stand outside in fear doing it because of what they think it's going to um, do to them. But for those who actually do it, they can testify from the inside out that the process of honoring Our Lady is a transformative process. What do I mean? I'm almost done with this, but what do I mean? Like there are some kinds of processes that don't transform you in any way, but they're defined by whatever the end is that you seek. So for instance, let's say I'm thirsty and I wanna to go to the refrigerator and grab a bottle of water. I have to go through a process of getting up, walking to the fridge, opening the door and grabbing the bottle of water and drinking it. That is a process that doesn't really change me, but it's a process that's defined by what I get at the end. But there are other processes that transform you so that even if you don't get anything at the end, the person that you are at the end of that process is different from the person you were at the beginning of that process. This is like learning a martial art, right? There are things you learn about the mind-body mm -hmm. connection. There are things you learn about discipline, about restraint, about self-control, so that when you're done learning martial arts, maybe you're like three, four, four years in, you realize that you have more than just the ability to kick and punch and block a kick. You realize that there's all this stuff that's happened to your character as a result of you doing that. In an analogous way, when we honor our mother, it is a process that transforms us and increases us in humility and increases us in our love for Jesus. Um, I heard Gabby Costello say this, mm -hmm. show me a person who prays the rosary daily. I will show you a person who is deeply devoted to the sacraments. Show me a person who prays a full rosary. I will show you someone who goes to confession regularly. I will show you someone who goes to mass regularly. I will show you someone who receives the Eucharist regularly. I will show you someone who makes themselves available for adoration to come and adore our Jesus and the blessed sacrament regularly. You know them by their fruits. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes what happens is when people say, oh, you guys do it too much. I think what's happening there is there's something strange looking that's going on. Any amount of it is going to be too much. I mean, <laughs> let, let, let's face it, holding up an icon of Mary is going to be too much mm -hmm. for some people because that's so culturally shocking. Mm -hmm. It's so scary. Um, 
but in terms of what are the fruits it's producing when people are truly devoting themselves to our mother. I think honoring Mary is, uh, is something that transforms every person. You, I, I would encourage people. There's, a, there's actually a video on YouTube uh, that's, I think it's called something like Testimonies of Praying the Full Rosary. And you have everyone from people that uh, were struggling in their marriage, people that were addicted to pornography, people that were addicted to drugs, people that were battling depression, talking about the power that Our Lady of Purity has to break them free from those things. So anyway, I, I may have gotten you into hot water by uh, oh, talking about this, but yeah, it's so 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 good. I yeah. think I think about like the church, the church lady, stereotypical church lady, yeah. praying the rosary after mass. You know, especially our elderly mothers and grandmothers who are in churches praying the rosary. Like across the world, there's going to be thousands, maybe more of them, just praying the rosary in the church right after yeah. the mass. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. They stay behind and they're praying. I think those prayers are one of the reasons we don't see the consequence for our sin, right. like abortion in this country, like nuclear war, yeah. the horrible things that could be consequences for the evils we commit yeah. are because of the mercies through the rosary. And I think the Divine Mercy Chaplet's very powerful too. Yeah, absolutely. But I just think those graces, we we are the recipients of graces we don't even realize because of the prayers, yeah. especially the prayer of the rosary. The other just quick thing is the uh, Mary saying in the Magnificat, you know, my soul magnifies the Lord, but she says, all generations will call me blessed. Yes, right. And what does that mean? If, you, if, you're, if you're a Catholic, you know what that means. We're, yeah. we're literally calling her blessed in the yeah. rosary. If you're an evangelical, how do you interpret that phrase? I am, I mean, we should maybe have one on the show to talk about this, but sure. what does it mean to call Mary blessed? Is that just some nicety? Hmm. What does it mean to call the mother of God blessed? And, and if she's saying all generations will do this, have you done it? Yeah, that's right. Have that's we right. done it? Are we doing it? But right. what were you going to say? Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. Um, I, I think language is a is a barrier here too, because mm-hmm. you know I know in my Protestant background, if you ask someone to define the word prayer, mm-hmm. it will almost always be defined in a way to where God is baked into the definition itself, right? So to mm-hmm. pray is to commune with God, to converse with God. It is something that you do exclusively mm-hmm. with God. Whereas when Catholics use the word pray, they often use it in that etymological sense of like pray, tell thee, you know, uh, or, or to ask, to make a request. And so when people say, well, why do you pray to Mary? I, I, I sometimes just sort of like change the language a little bit to, to let someone else hear it in a way that reflects how it actually is. And I say, we pray to God together with and through Mary and the saints. We pray together with the saints because we are asking them to join in our ongoing prayer. The very fact that we're asking them to pray for us is an indication that we already have faith in the Mm -hmm. power of prayer and we have a prayer life that is already being directed towards God. So we're asking them to join us in our ongoing act of prayer. But we're also also praying through them by asking Mm -hmm. them to pray for us in the same way that I would ask you to pray for me, knowing that the prayers of the righteous availeth much, knowing that we're told in the scriptures to pray for one another, that we might be healed. And so we're doing that. And so um, it becomes a kind of lost opportunity when we have the saints that are there ready to pray for us to ever pray without doing it with or through them. Not because we can't go directly to God, we're always doing that, but rather it's an opportunity to have them go with mm-hmm. us and on behalf of us in that same way. So that's that's one way I like to uh, to articulate it because mm-hmm. they, you know, Jesus says, "I am the the God of the living, not the God of the dead." They are more alive than us. I We're love far that. closer to death than they the are. saints in heaven are more alive yeah, than us. Mary is us. more alive. Yeah, they're like, "Well, she's dead. Why do you ask for her prayer? She's dead." It's like she's actually very much alive in in eternity yeah. in heaven with with God our Father. Um, Okay, so how did you just you just dropped it? You were Protestant, yeah, and you became Catholic, yeah, and you were saying your wife was Catholic, and yeah. she said he'd never, he's never gonna become Catholic. Yeah. And look at you, <laughs> your hair with the rosary, telling us all we got to pray it. How, okay, first of all, how how anti-Catholic were you? What did that look like when you say you, your wife would have never said you become Catholic? Were you? Would, did you tell her this is ridiculous? I'm never gonna do it. I respect you, but mm. not this practice. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I was ever anti-Catholic. Okay. I I think I may have inherited um, most of the misgivings, particularly about the papacy, things like that mm. that that most Protestants might have. 
Um, I'm, I'm blessed to say that I never had any misgivings towards Our Lady. Um, devotion to her never really played a role in, in my faith, and I didn't really think about her, her much, but um, I never had any negative feelings towards Mary. I never had any negative thoughts towards Mary, and I'm, I'm thankful that I, I don't have to walk back anything I've ever said about her um, in mm. some heated argument with the Protestant or, or with the Catholic or anything But you like were that. Protestant before becoming Catholic. Yeah, I was Protestant. And you were practiced, like that was a big part yeah, of yeah, your a- life. Absolutely. You were serious about your faith. It wasn't absolutely. like you were atheist and became Catholic. Absolutely. Uh, very serious about my faith. And um, I think part of that was part of the whole, I'm never doing this kind of thing. It's just growing up, I went to so much church. Being a pastor's son, and being Pentecostal, it wasn't just a Sunday mm-hmm. thing. It was often, you know, four or five days a week, you know, being in church. And I was just like church burnout, right? Um, another thing is um, I, I started to sort of gravitate towards the idea that like, hey, just my personal relationship with God is what matters. Mm-hmm. And I became very picky and choosy with regards to what Christians I associated mm-hmm. with. If I didn't think they were mature enough, I didn't think they were righteous enough. I didn't think they were focused on the right things. I wouldn't really put up with them. I didn't have a strong sense of moral obligation to attend church services for sure, uh, let alone to attend church or to stick with a church or put up with a church um, where there are are people that I don't like. And that's not to say that now I believe that you should just deal with (laughs) anything that comes your way, uh, but you're certainly going to have to face the fact that no matter what parish you choose, um, you, you have some some moral obligations uh, to the body of Christ that are going to cost you some convenience and that are going to uh, lead to some interaction with people that are disappointing to you and vice versa, because I think everybody is someone's reason for not going to church. Mm. Uh, I'm someone's reason for not going to church. You're someone's reason. Um, Even the person who doesn't go to church, they're someone's reason for not going to church because if they did go and they were representing in the right kind of way, they might change the game for that kind of person. Mm. So we all have someone who looks at us. And points at us like, if that's if that guy or if that girl is what it's all about, I want nothing to do with it, right? Because we are someone else's definition of annoying. But I think I had a lot of that going on. Um, a lot of that about Catholics, or just a lot, just a lot about, about that church a lot in about general. The church in general, and when it comes to Catholics in particular, I when it comes to the church going experience, mm-hmm. it seemed to me that Catholics were mostly just very machine like. It, it, <laughs> it, it looked like. They went out of duty and obligation. Mm -hmm. They're all stressed out and mad at each other when they're getting ready for church. And by the time (laughs) they go, they hate each other for making each other Hey, not when there's donuts after mass, okay? (laughs) But even then, I saw it as like Catholics just, and they run after church. Like as soon as it's over, they're out of there. Before it's over, they're out of there. That's because we got the Eucharist. We're like powered (laughs) up and ready to go. (laughs) You got to know the secrets for why that is. These were the perceptions at the time, right? These were the kind of perceptions. Mm So I had a lot of those types of hangups. And I, I also... I also didn't see it as necessary to be committed to one denomination or another. Mm. I knew Catholicism did not claim to be a denomination in the way that Protestants speak of denominations, but you know, in Protestant ecclesiology, uh, none of that stuff really matters too much anyway. All right, you're Baptist, um, you're Calvinist, uh, you're Pentecostal, you're non-denominational, you believe in Jesus, we're good, except for Catholics. <laughs> All right, so what, what cracked the code for you? Man, how'd you become Catholic then? You know, it's it's funny because um, twenty years ago, I I took the philosophical journey. I had a brother who was in Bible school at the time, and he was uh, delving into like reading a lot of like Eastern Orthodoxy, and and introduced me to the Church Fathers. And at that time, you know, I, I was reading a bunch of stuff and and taking that kind of like academic approach to it. And I was looking into Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism, and I was going to uh, Orthodox liturgy, Orthodox v- Vespers, then going to like daily mass, uh, <laughs> primarily because like nobody was there <laughs> and nobody would bother me. So I went to daily mass because I was like, oh, nobody goes to this one. So I'll go to that. And uh, <laughs> you were so, an introvert or you just didn't want to hang with? In- more introvert. Okay. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> I, I remember just sort of uh, at that time, I, I paid a, a hefty social price for getting pretty open about my exploration of Catholicism. I had a lot of people. Mm. Pentecostal um, kid, yeah. I, I had a lot of people who were pointing me out as an example of mm. like, hey man, this is this is what the devil can do. 
if you're not careful. Look at this brother and how deceived he is. And I had, you know, people confront me, people challenge me. And at that time, I'll just be honest, there was a, there was a lot of pride. There was a lot of immaturity in how I handle that. And so sometimes when people challenged me, um, I treated it solely like an academic issue. And um, I challenged back, but in a way that wasn't gracious, in a way that was characterized by a lot of bitterness and resentment for them not loving me or supporting me or getting me. And, and during that time, I just got so burned out on the, on the experience and the social costs that um, I was like, man, forget all of this. This is, this is why I hate church anyway. And I kind of went the opposite direction a little, you know, where watching the way my church people responded to me in that journey made me bitter, made me resentful, and made me hate church. And I, I applied that to Protestants and Catholics. Um, I'll fast forward and give you the shorter version because we're way past short. <laughs> um, an, old high, an old classmate from grade school and high school, uh, Elizabeth Robinson Young, uh, I reconnect with her. Her and um, her husband, they run a camp called Camp Veritas. And they um, uh, they do this every year, and it's a it's a Catholic camp, you know, and it's all about Jesus. But they bring all these different, you know, kids together. They do different activities and so on. And she invited me to come out and do a talk. And I went out, and for the first time in my life, I went to Eucharistic Adoration. Mm. And that'll do it. That did it. <laughs> that did it. Um, when I went back to my room mm. after Eucharistic adoration, um, th this is a part of my story that mm. is tough for me because it's tough for me because of because of pride. It's tough to me because of ego. And I'll just mm. be honest about this. What I want to tell you is that I read a thousand books. <laughs> At the end of reading a thousand books, I was like, all right, this is the reasonable choice. And I chose that. And I'm Catholic now. Yeah. Because I like to think that if you try to come at me with those objections and questions, that I could I could handle it. That's that's how I like to see myself. And yeah, I did that like 20 years ago. That didn't make me Catholic. That didn't get me over the hump. There was more to it than that. And when I went to adoration, it was just something that happened and I can't explain. I, I remember coming back to my room and it was like a punch from the inside that said, you're Catholic. And just like that signal grace story I told you about, it was kind of like, <laughs> you know, the crazy thoughts that pass through the mind sometimes. And it hit me again. You're Catholic. And... I I just knew and I began to cry and it was like it was like the scale the scales fell from my eyes. Um and it was like the if it was like it was like my skepticism became a kind of energy that dissipated. And my relationship to questions were were different in that moment. And, and here's the only way I can kind of give an, an analogy to explain it. Um, imagine that my wife and I agree to have dinner at six o'clock and um, she comes home at 8.30. And when she walks in, I say, where the heck have you been? Okay, that's a question, right? But there's an energy behind that question, right? And if she doesn't answer it a certain way, we, we might not be doing too well, right? Okay, now let's do the same scenario. Let's say my wife and I agree to have dinner at six o'clock. She comes in at 8.30 and I'm reading the book and I see her and I go, hey, I said, where you been? What have you been up to today? Same question, different energy behind it, right? The, the energy behind this question is one that says, look, I know there's an answer, right? I don't even know what it is. I know there's an answer. And I'm asking you out of curiosity. I'm asking you out of excitement. I'm asking you out of passion. I'm asking you out of the desire to connect. I'm asking you out of love. And I felt that energetic shift where the questions that I had about the faith 
shifted from having that sort of like antagonistic, suspicious energy behind it to having that energy of curiosity and love and passion behind it. And so it wasn't like a flash of insight where I just like knew everything. Mm. It was more like a, a falling away of that energy of skepticism. You know, um, it was almost like whatever was behind me doing this, those hands were removed and when I could you, just see. When yeah. you saw Jesus held up in adoration, the Eucharist, the host, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, that's what we believe as yeah, Catholics. Yeah, at no point did I even understand any of that. You didn't understand no. it, but that it was after seeing that, being in that room when adoration was Absolutely. happening, something just Absolutely. And moved you. I, I Listen, I was so ignorant of Eucharistic adoration that not only did I not know what Catholics were supposed to believe about that, but I had no concept of any stories about what's supposed to happen to a person when they're in the presence of the Blessed mm -hmm. Sacrament. So I didn't have any vocabulary of that. And if someone had tried to explain that to me, I would have been like, oh, okay, that's great, that's great, that's great, you know? But I was there, and it was just a part of my experience of being there. Um, and Eucharistic adoration has played a huge role in my life since then. Even, even while going through RCIA, I... I looked at Eucharistic adoration as like the children's bread, as, as, as the mercy of Christ, because you're going through our CIA and you don't receive, <laughs> but it's like, wait a minute, you mean that he is there sacramentally present in the blessed sacrament there in the tabernacle? Are you kidding me? And I can go. And I, and I always think about St. Veronica, the woman with the issue of blood who says, mm -hmm. if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. I, Whenever I think about the Blessed Sacrament, I think about that story and I think, man, if she can press through and reach out to touch the hem of his garment and experience the wholeness of Christ in response to that, how much more can I experience his wholeness if I can be present with him in the Holy Eucharist at adoration like that? And so I, I strive to, to make that a priority and go as often as I can. You know, and, and guess what brought me to that understanding? Guess what made me really passionate about Eucharistic adoration? Guess what made me really eager to read up on it? And, and guess what makes me devote myself to it even when I get, get distracted? Our Lady. Our Lady. I, I love Jesus more than I ever have um, because, of, because of what Our Lady has taught me. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Thanks for encouraging me to love Our Lady more and everyone listening, I hope. I wanted to ask you one more thing. I know we're going long here. Thank you for doing this with me. You you said this when you were walking and we didn't set on the show yet, but I was like, oh, we got, I got to ask him about that. I know it's connected into all of this. You're not on social media and your podcast, which is again, this huge podcast, the Minimalist Podcast, is not doing Instagram reels, all of the little knickknacky social media engagement stuff. Yeah. Um, I have a brother who does podcasting, Sing the Hours, Liturgy of the Hours, and he calls it fast media and how it's toxic for the soul is this whole thing. Oh, we talk about this. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, we do fast media on the show. We put the show up on Instagram. We have it on YouTube and the shorts, but why are you off social media, especially when you're doing media, you're doing a show sure. and you want, I'm sure people to listen to it, yeah. but you guys are all going dark on social. Yeah, well, How do you do a podcast while you go dark on social? <laughs> right. Well, it's not an act of renunciation. Right? It, it's, it's not a condemnation of people that are on social media. That's good, because I'm still, <laughs> still here for now anyways. And, and, and I may be back. You okay. Know? Um, for me personally, it started with Lent and me thinking about, what am I going to give up? And I, and I want to give up something that is an actual sacrifice. And I, I think it might actually be good for me. I don't want to just make up something, you know? And so... Um, I decided, oh, social media would be really hard. Um, that'd be very tough. But then at the same time, it's the amount of time to where it's just right. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in this age, it can be easy to feel like you're going to die if you're off social media. You will cease to be relevant. You're only as significant as your last post, right, or as your last viral post. And so there's some of that. And I thought, oh, boy, that would be great to take a break from that sensation. But also how good could that be for me to just have to exercise that discipline and not click in and just pour all that time into the rosary 
into Eucharistic adoration and, and, and spiritual reading. And so I got off for that. But at the same time, we're also having these conversations, Josh and I from The Minimalists, about what it might look like if we did that for The Minimalists as a whole. And then we had Cal Newport on our show who wrote a book called Digital Minimalism. And oh, we got to have him on. You got to have him on. I've He's, heard about that book. It's It yeah. sounds very important to talk about. <laughs> you got to have him on. And he's one of the greatest storytellers. He's mm. got a deep, deep bag of real stories from history for just about anything that you all talk about. So I highly recommend him. But we we're talking about that. And um, and he, he talked a little bit about his social media life. And he's, he's on social media, but just the benefits that have come from his increased capacity to do deep work. And that's something that's been attractive to me for a long time. I, I, I feel that longing to do deep work. I feel that longing even to do uh, deep study. So like one, one of the things on social media is like every week, there are a thousand new videos that you got to watch to know what's going on, right? You got to create to keep up with it. That's and, keeping up with the Kardashians digitally, like not exactly, but you know, that's right. keep on posting once, twice a day, keep it going. That's right. It's a lot. Yeah, and and I, I think about I think about where I want to be in my life, mm -hmm. and I and I think about how I want to look back on my time. So I, I know you had the conversation with Jimmy Aiken, right, just the other day about Pope Francis. Let's let's take almost anything that Pope Francis says. There are going to be, I would say, just even from the most recent thing, there are probably over three hundred videos about that aspect of what Pope Francis said in the past week. We're not talking about all the other times, right? Yeah. There are probably like hundreds of new videos. So it's possible to spend, let's say, 50 hours consuming content on Pope Francis and, and what you like have learned. one thing he said. One thing he said. Yeah. Different people's a good point. interpretation of it. And, and I'm not saying it's wrong to participate in any of yeah. those conversations. But, but when I try to compare that with like St. Robert Bellarmine's book that's, that's this thick on the papacy, and I think 50 hours on that. 50 hours on this. Mm, right? Read the book on the papacy by Bellarmine or read the other stuff that Francis, Holy Father is saying that is beautiful, good and true, even in, in or outside of context, meaning you're not gonna get these lines that are, oh, is that true? Is this a viol is this heresy? Because he's saying a lot of beautiful, good stuff that right. would shore up the faith in addition to these things that are confusing people. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, like you could... Read, you could listen to a thousand debates and discussions about Mary. You can read a thousand tweets where Protestants and Catholics are going back and forth. But then it's like, God forbid that my whole life should pass me by and I've never read St. Alphonsus Liguori's The mm. Glories of Mary. But that's over 600 pages, right? <laughs> and maybe I should just stick with the tweets, but it's like, man, I, I want to look back on my life and say, I read that. More importantly, I internalize that, right? And so doing a lot of deep reading and deep work has been a big driving factor for me. And um, and it's been a driving factor for both of us in, in some different ways. And so we said, let's take a break for a year and let's see what we learn. The let's, whole show. Well, not the whole show, but, I, I, but specifically um, no Twitter, no Facebook, um, no Instagram. For you, for just you or for the rest of the talent on the show? Both of the us hosts. now. For, for the minimalist and and does myself, the minimalist person. podcast have pages that they're still putting stuff up on or not? So no. we still upload the audio version of the podcast. We're taking a break from the video and the reels. Not we, even video. Yeah, yeah and so, no reels. So we're just doing an audio version of the podcast, and that goes up on Spotify and you know wherever you listen to podcasts. And we still use YouTube archivally where we we take the audio version of the podcast and we put it up on. So YouTube. you've even cut the video. From the show. Yeah, we're not doing video. Um, okay, so no the, new reels, no new TikToks, uh, any of that. No TikTok. And we're no, no, nothing on Twitter or X or Facebook. Okay, or how Instagram. do you market the show without all that stuff? How, how was that? I mean, because this is a business too, right? This is your guys' business. So know. how is it going? <laughs> <laughs> Should we do this, Harris? <laughs> I mean, but seriously, like how, how is it going? I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. To, to, to stop doing your social media as a show. And for you to stop your personal social media and the minimalist podcast is a big podcast is just cutting social media, except mm. putting it on YouTube, just audio. Mm. I yeah. mean, are your downloads down? I don't know if you can share that. Yeah. Well, so last year, before we went off social media, we had uh, our biggest year yet. And um, 
now, definitely numbers are down because we we don't have Instagram numbers, right? Well, I mean, we may, but we're not checking it and reporting it. But you know how these social media sites work. You, um, you become irrelevant to the algorithm because you're not feeding the machine. Like they can't make any money off us, right? They're like, we're not contributing any value. We're just, our old stuff is up there. So we're not showing up on people's news feeds or anything. Only people that see us are people that look for us. And when they come find us, they just see there hasn't been anything that's updated. So numbers are definitely down. And I would say uh, economically, yeah, the argument is is against it. The argument is against it. I, I would say spiritually, philosophically, it's been refreshing as all get out. But So are, is, the, is the gamble like, okay, we're gonna, it might hurt the business this year, but we're gonna do this no social media thing for the sake of the quality of our own minds and souls and our podcast, and then mm. maybe in the future we'll go back on. I mean, wh what's the kind of, is there yeah. a discussion about the tactic here? <laughs> like, you know, like, the strategy? What the heck are you doing, man? What the heck are you doing? I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, all yeah. in. I mean, I don't like yeah, being yeah. on social media myself. So I'm yeah. curious, what's the, the yeah. long game here? Yeah, so- Maybe the, it's an, a big experiment, I don't know. Well, it's partially that. And, and, and part of the thing about discovery is that if you know what you're going to find, it's not a discovery. Right? And so, <laughs> fair, so, so part fair. of it is a discovery. An another aspect of it is this. I don't want to reach more people. I want to reach fewer people more deeply. Mm. And it's good. I don't I don't feel like there's anything in the Catholic faith that's requiring me to think this way in spite of myself, but I I am feeling more and more drawn to things that are smaller. But, but richer in quality of interaction. And that's both in the context of what we do as, as the minimalists and also just in my own personal life. And so now things like, hey, we got a great RCIA teacher and just assisting him in the class feels way more exciting than like just about anything else I've done. Um, but in addition to that, we, we are beginning to discover some cool things that have come up as a result of this time, so for instance, we we're doing more live shows, and our live shows aren't like huge. We're not um, packing Carnegie Hall. We just have a small little theater in L.A., and anywhere from like seventy-five to one hundred people show up once a month. That's like a fraction of our total following. But man, what an awesome time it is to see people face to face, to interact with them, to have time to hang out for coffee beforehand and afterhand. Uh, you know, afterwards, it's that's really awesome. Um, Josh came to me and was like, Hey, what do you think about doing, uh, doing some coaching? Like we got a lot of people who at the events or through email say, Hey, do you ever do any one-on-one -on -one coaching? And I was like, that'd be total fun. I'd love that. And so I started doing something called clutter counseling where people sign up for one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. And it's no longer like, Hey, you asking a question and I'm kind of guessing at what's going on in your life and answering it the best that I can. It's me working with that person for an hour and being able to do that. Um, writing, we're starting to write more, um, and, uh, and, and create more in terms of courses and so on. So I guess you could say on the, on the business side, on the creative side, there are ideas that have come up for us in this space that's come about from from being off social media. And and I think there's some good stuff there and, and we're still letting that unfold. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be my, my answer for now. But it's, there are definitely moments where you're getting ready to do something and you say, hey, it would be really nice if, um, you know, we just went on Twitter and announced that and we went on Instagram and announced that. But we said we're gonna do it for the rest of the year. We're just gonna do it for the rest do, of the year. Do you do an email list? We have an email list. Okay. Yeah. Is this and the year started in January? When did your No, it started um in, in March for okay. the rest of the year. For the you rest gotta of come back on in six months at yeah. the one year anniversary. I wanna hear how what the like the plan is. Yeah, yeah. It's it's great. I mean, I I think that if everyone did what you were doing, like everyone, we all made a mutual agreement worldwide <laughs> to get off Instagram and X and all this stuff, I think the world would be better. Yeah. But you know, it, there's a cost to doing it and mm. being one of the people like I haven't done it. I'm still on, you know? So mm. I have one of my best friends. She's totally off of it. Stephanie Gray Connor. She's a oh. pro-life apologist. Wow. She just has an email list and she's making an impact in yeah. a, in a very important way. So it, it, it's an interesting one. That's a, that's something we got to check back in on in six months. Uh, I'd be where happy the thought to. process yeah. is. I'd be happy to. And you know, it, it may very well be the case that we come back on social media with a, a fresh perspective mm. 
and and with an increased sense of confidence because i tell you like the the big question was can can we survive and do this can we actually get away with this and it looks like we're getting away with this and i think that's the biggest revelation for me cuz that's a question i've been asking about for a long time can i get away meaning it's still a solvent media? business is what you're saying your business you're like saying the numbers are down but you're still operating it's still i'm guessing profitable for you guys yeah. you're finding other revenue streams maybe and the opportunity to do meaningful work and to meaningfully engage other people in meaningful ways they still keep coming some kind of way well here you are yeah this might be a reel on my instagram all right <laughs> <laughs> so you will be on instagram if that's okay but um tk this has been an awesome conversation thank yeah. you likewise appreciate we got to have you back on you're local so we'll do, we got to do this again and let me give you your flowers here because oh, we got flowers yeah 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 uh, uh verbal flowers so um, one of the unfortunate things about our time is that we live in, um, uh, how do I put this? People love to criticize from afar. Um, they, they love to say, let me make a video on why this person's an idiot and why all their arguments are wrong. People love to stitch. They love to clip something that someone says and then refute them from afar. But no one gets into the room to debate. It's very hard to get two people of opposing ideologies to come in the room together and actually debate. There's, by the way, um, there's two universities, started to interrupt, but Dartmouth and University of Texas, Austin, Texas, they both asked me to debate. They're asking a bunch of other pro-abortion people to do a debate with me. They can't find it. There's no luck so far. It's tough. Do you know, like during, uh, when COVID first started, yeah. I saw these two guys on Twitter arguing over lockdowns. One guy was like, we shouldn't do this. This is bad. The other guy was like, you're a total idiot. We mm -hmm. should. And, and this is very early on. And I'm like, oh man, like both of these guys sound like they're like really well informed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I reach out to the guy who says we shouldn't do lockdowns. I send him a message and I say, hey, if I bring you guys on my show and I moderate the debate, uh, would you be willing to debate this guy? And he goes, totally, anytime, just let me know. And I go, great. And I go to the other guy and I say the same thing to him. He's like, no, I'm busy and I, I've got this and that going on. And he just had a whole laundry list mm -hmm. of stuff. And I go, well, what about like in a month or something like that? He's like, no, I'm just really busy time of my life. But he was on Twitter all day. <laughs> he, had, he had all the time in the world on right, Twitter, right? right? He just was yeah. busy for, too busy for a, a one hour debate, yep. I guess. But you see that so mm -hmm. much. And we're, 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 we're kind of like in this space of refutation by disgust, mm. refutation by meme, you know, mm. reputation by mockery. Oh, hey, you disagree yeah. with me. I think you're wrong. I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to mock you. I'm going to express how mm. disgusted I am with you. But the way ideas evolve, the way critical thinking grows, and the way that we grow as people is we get in the same room with people who disagree. And without fear, we say, hey, look, let's talk it out. And I'm going to tell you why I think your position is incorrect and I'm going to give you my reasons why and I'm not mm -hmm. going to run and I'm not going to substitute mockery for debate. And you are one of the few people that have demonstrated your willingness to do that. So I wanted to praise your courage. <laughs> I wanted to praise your conviction uh, because there are a lot of people that will eat you alive in the YouTube comments, <laughs> but they won't step in the room with you to have a conversation. And you're that person who steps into the room. So much Thank respect. you, TK. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I can keep doing it and yeah. have the opportunity. You are awesome. Thanks for making the time for the conversation. Absolutely. You're Thank an you. inspiration. It's awesome. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.